Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another webinar by Data Platform Geeks. So today we have two speakers from Microsoft, Colin Popel and George Gomez, um, and they are delivering the session on Query Diagnostics in Power BI. My name is Arati Nambiar and I'll be a host for the next few minutes and Mamita Sinha will be helping me with the moderation. So today's webinar, uh, it is being organized by SQL Server Geeks and Data Platform Geeks communities. We have precisely three community things that I'll be talking to you. One is SQL Server Geeks. Uh, log into sqlservergeeks.com where you will be lot, uh, finding lots of contents like videos, blogs, and articles around SQL Server. And then we have the wider community called as Data Platform Geeks, which covers a lot of things under Microsoft Data Platform. So once in a year, we do organize this org and, uh, annual learning event called as Data Platform Summit, which is the international signature uh, technology event here in India. So it happens in Bangalore in the month of August or September. The link you can see on the right hand side is the bit.ly social link. You can check the link and subscribe to many channels that we have uh, for SQL Server Geeks, Data Platform Geeks and Data Platform Summit. You can keep yourself up to date on all the community activities we do. So as I was talking about Data Platform Summit, uh, it's an international learning event. This event uh, began in 2015 and we have delivered five conferences, one each year. So DPS 2020 is still undecided from a date perspective. So as you all know, due to the COVID outbreak, we are still waiting for the appropriate time to organize this year's conference. So uh, the vision behind SQL's uh, Data Platform Summit is empowering data and AI transformation. So uh, this is a group picture taken at uh, Data Platform Summit 2019. We do cherish this conference where we had lots of attendees. We had more than 1,000 uh, delegates from 16 different countries joined us. So this is the only event in Asia where uh, the Microsoft product team members and global MVPs joined to deliver session. So the sessions happen in person and a lot of advanced concepts and you'll get to uh, hear directly from the product team members. So which is one of the key benefits in joining the event. The event is all about learning and networking with worldwide experts. So if you want to know more about Data Platform Summit, you can log into dps10.com or drop in an email to contact at dps10.com. The links are all given in the chat window. So here is the uh, DPG code team, mem uh, code team. Amit Bansal, who is the founder and president. Manohar Punna, the vice president. And a lot of other team members from Data Platform Geeks and eDominus systems. Thanks to all, uh, this is all their collective effort and uh, help with which we are able to organize so many in-person events, webinars and virtual symposiums. Special thanks to Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft has recognized us and supported us in all our community initiatives. Uh, see, we also want to thank our knowledge partner for today's webinar, that is SQL Maestros. There are a lot of offerings by SQL Maestros like hands-on labs, uh, video courses, and many uh, learning materials. So log into sqlmaestros.com to know uh, to explore everything that uh, SQL Maestros has to offer. So you can also drop in a mail to contact at sqlmaestros.com. The links are all given in the chat window. So a few of you might have joined the direct uh, today's webinar using the direct Zoom link, which you would have got from the social media. So make sure you are a member of Data Platform Geeks community. So please visit dataplatformgeeks.com and join the community. So once you are a member, you can book your seat for the upcoming events you wish to attend. All our events are free to attend. You just need to register once and book the seat you wish to attend. Also kindly whitelist uh, Data Platform Geeks domain to your address book so that you don't miss out any of our updates. And also, if you're a member of uh, Data Platform Geeks, you get to access all the event resources. Immediately after the webinar, we do send out mails to all the registered members with the recording, webinar recording and resources. So I uh, kindly uh, register to Data Platform Geeks. We have, uh, we have lots of channels on Telegram, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, etc. I'm not uh, listing out them right now. You can just find them all in the link given in chat window, bit.ly slash DPG social. You can follow us or join us from the channel you're active on or most preferred. So the links are given in the chat window. 
A small uh, request uh, before we begin the webinar. Uh, due to COVID outbreak, as you know, most of the members from the IT uh, facility are out of jobs or on unpaid leave. So it will be a great help if we would uh, help them with uh, upskilling or reskilling themselves. So all you could do is uh, if you could copy paste this text in your social channel, this will definitely help uh, to inform the people in IT community who are in need of such free uh, trainings. So the text is given in the chat window. I request you all to copy the text and paste it in your social channels. I just want to bring to your attention uh, the YouTube channels we have. Uh, all our webinars are recorded and posted in our YouTube channel, uh, YouTube slash SQL Server Geeks. Apart from the webinars, you'll also find uh, more uh, videos there related to SQL Server. And we also have lots of web uh, videos on SQL Server internal performance on our channel, uh, SQL Maestros. So the links are again given in the chat window. And you can also feel free uh, to join us in the uh, through the mobile app Telegram. Uh, lots of community members are active on Telegram. The links are there in the chat window. So without any more delay, let me hand it over to the speaker. Colin and George, thank you so much uh for taking out time to deliver session to us over to you no problem um so let me share my screen uh, so can you see my screen not yet not yet Hold on. let's try this again Yeah, I can see your screen, Colin. Great. So my name is Colin Popel. I'm a senior PM in the data integration team at Microsoft. Um, I work on, among other things, Power Query, um, connectivity, diagnostics, things like that, extensibility. Um, and along with me here uh, this afternoon, or tonight for us, I have Jorge. Uh, Jorge, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hello, my name is Jorge Gomez. I'm a senior software engineer, and uh, I also work in the Power Query team. But I'm in charge of uh, of uh, coding some of these uh, functionality, for example, query diagnostics. And I've also worked in uh, multiple connectors uh, with a specialty in uh, SAP connectors. So uh, today we're going to talk about query diagnostics, which is a feature we've been um, releasing incrementally over the last few months. And there's a lot more to come. So we're going to show you kind of what we've put out, a little bit of what's to come soon, and talk a bit about what we hope to enable in the future. So uh, why do we need query diagnostics? Um, what can you get out of it today? And then finally, uh, we're going to do some demos. Uh, I'm going to do a demo kind of going into the, the basic usage, and then Jorge is going to go into some SAP stuff and performance counter stuff. So to start with, let's talk about why we've invested in query diagnostics. So as many of you will know, if you've used Power Query in any significant capacity, uh, sometimes it behaves a little bit mysteriously. Uh, Power Query does quite a bit. It um, connects to very many data sources, and these data sources are often um, unalike. It takes transformations uh, regardless of the data source's capabilities and it applies it to that data so you can get it into a format that you want. And often um, very small changes can, uh, from the user's perspective, can yield very large differences in outcomes. Um, you can also have changes over time that you want to understand. And so the, the top level goal is to understand what time is being spent on what types of actions, um, where that time is being spent, locally or remotely, and what you're getting from it. Um, and so this helps clarify what's causing a given outcome. You know, how many, how much did we end up hitting a cache, or although that's not actually in yet. Um, what connectors are we hitting? What data sources are we hitting? How long are they taking to respond? Uh, how long did a refresh take, all in all? Stuff like that. Uh, it helps us close the feedback loop of tuning reports. Um, so if you're working on a query and uh, one step is really fast and another is really slow, you might be able to find out that, well, that's because 
uh, one of the steps, it was folding everything to the backend data source, which is to say it had a way to map the transformation that you were doing to the server that you were retrieving data from. Um, and then the next step you applied, that server had no concept of that thing. So it all had to happen locally, which is gonna take uh, a lot longer. Um, and even if we don't have a way to light up, hey, this is the problem, right? Uh, it lets you have a much better understanding of what's going on. Uh, and then finally, it really helps simplify debugging um, for power users and technical experts. So if you have a consultant or you are a consultant, if you have a central IT team, or even if you're contacting Microsoft for um, support or to point out a bug, being able to really easily look at this standardized way of dealing with logs, of surfacing this information, makes life easier for pretty much everybody. So we have um, a variety of outputs available today. So the first set of outputs, which are, are kind of come in a ba basic and a detailed form, uh, deal with the query operations happening. How much time is being spent where? Like we said, you know, local um, and various data sources. What are the impact of your actions on query time? Um, although getting this back out is, you know, a little bit complicated in how you have to visualize. Uh, understanding what queries the system is generating that you might not have caused directly. So this is like, uh, if you are working in, say, direct query against a SQL server and you decide to do a filter dropdown, um, it's going to generate uh, a query for that filter dropdown. So understanding what's happening there. Uh, and then finally, having some idea of what the actual query being sent to the back end is. Um, so if I do the exact same series of actions on the exact same set of data on SQL versus OData, um, which is a demo I, I like to do, and I'll probably show some of it now, um, it's going to show something different for SQL versus OData. Uh, in SQL, all of the relational operations that I'm doing are going to be able to map to that SQL server. But in OData, very few of those are going to map to that um, OData endpoint. So it can be important to understand what exactly you're generating and what you're getting out of it. Uh, but on top of that, there's a lot of other questions that are kind of associated um, with this area. So uh, for for the sake of understanding, um, and I know that, that Jorge is laughing at me right now, uh, firewall here should be labeled uh, data privacy, which is how we actually uh, present it publicly in the UI. Um, so in... Uh, we have two additional categories, uh, one that's out today and one that's coming very soon. Uh, performance is like what kind of system resources are being used by different queries? Uh, what time of processor time, um, memory, uh, IO, stuff like that. It's getting again a bit more complicated and that's more, more for understanding what the engine's doing. And then how can you look at utilization over time or by different evaluations? And then with, um, data privacy, you want to maybe be able to understand what kinds of resources are being categorized in terms of privacy groupings. Uh, if you're having an issue, maybe it's because this particular data source is being categorized as private and it can't talk to the other ones. And being able to really easily see that in one space associated with the actual evaluations that you have um, in your primary query is helpful for being able to understand and debug. So I'm gonna do what I said and kind of go through query diagnostics for SQL and OData. Uh, so let me go over here to my, um, my kind of pre-configured tables here. So what you can see here is I have a connection to an OData feed and I'm just gonna copy this so I can get a new one. New source. Okay, so let's just go for the customers table again, just to make life easy. And it's gonna load that in real quick.
great. So this is, you know, there's nothing special here. That's about exactly what you would expect. Um, now, before I go any further, I'm going to go into diagnostic options and I'm going to make sure that I'm spitting out the diagnostics that I actually want to see. Um, so for the sake of this, just for uh, ease for this one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just stick to the aggregated uh, diagnostics. I'll come back to the detailed later. Um, and if I want to look and see, okay, if I just ran this step, uh, what would I get? We can click diagnose step. And what that's going to do is it's going to start recording the traces. It's going to refresh that particular step. Um, and it's going to stop recording the traces. And then we're given an additional, we're given a new table here that tells us some information about uh, what we got out of that. So uh, if we look at this sequence of um, data source queries, what we can see at the bottom here, um, Maybe let's go like a real quick over the columns in case people are not familiar. Yeah, with that's the that's a good point. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so I can go over them if you want. Sure. So. Uh, uh, so so in the in, we have like a, a five different kinds of outputs. We have the we have four different kinds of ad outputs: uh, aggregated, detailed, then we have performance counters and uh, privacy partitions. So for the first two outputs, aggregated and detailed, what we're doing is uh, gathering traces from the mashup engine. And uh, we basically gather those traces and format them in a way that's like friendly and accessible. And we keep it like, consistent. We have a schema that we follow to report this information. So the first column in this schema is the ID. The ID represents a single evaluation. Um, as Colin showed in the tools tab, we have like uh, two modes of using query diagnostics. We have a session mode, which is uh, represented by the start button and the stop button. That represents when you, uh, when you want to record like multiple actions, when you want to record like a, a series of actions. You want you press the start button, then you do your series of actions, and then when you're done, you press the stop button. Then you're gonna have example, like multiple evaluations. Yeah, for example, um, if you are seeing delays when you um, connect to new data source, you might use it then to understand what yeah. what types of queries are being emitted to pull back the metadata about that data source. And if you want like something more pointed, and this is actually what I tend to use more often, is the diagnose step. This will like diagnose a single step. And it will like not take into account the other steps. It will like be like the less noisy version of the of the session of the recording session. And they will output like similar information. The the big difference is that the session might include multiple uh, evaluations, and the step diagnostic will always include a single evaluation. So this is step diagnostics. All the i the id column will always contain the this one point two. Uh, this a little bit strange format of one point two actually has some meaning. The first number, the one, in this case, represents a single activity. So every time you click a button on Power BI, that's considered an activity. But an activity can result in one or multiple queries. So if an, if an activity results in multiple queries, then you will have 1.2, you can have 1.3, 1.4, 1.5. And those, all those uh, queries would represent like something that was output based on a single action, a single user action. Next, we have the query and step columns. Those are like fairly easy to understand. They show which query and which step were, uh, which query was like uh, recorded and which step was recorded. These map uh, exactly have, to the the what we, what you would see on the left hand and the right hand side here. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, uh, if you have a query with uh, no steps, which is possible you might have a, st a step empty. Uh, then you have a category column, and this represents just broadly what kind of operation is being represented by this line. Okay. So here we can see like some more evaluation. It means that we're evaluating a query. Uh, then we have data source. It means we're like we're interacting with an underlying data source. We have a data source kind, which will tell you which kind of data source. This is very useful in like if you have a query that goes to multiple data sources, and you can see which of these lines correspond to which data source. 
Uh, then we have the operation, which is like a little bit of a level, another level of detail on what the the engine was doing when resolving this query. So for example, we can see here that there were like a more uh, several requests. Uh, uh, then we can see when they st when the this operation started and when it ended. We can see what was the amount of the exclusive duration, and this is very helpful to like understand, uh, for example, what is taking the longest. So for example, in in here we can see that this five point fifty six percent is much uh, higher than the other one. So maybe we want to like see what's happening there. In this case, it's an evaluation, so it's. Like, not very relevant, but sometimes you will see that uh, you might see that the metadata step is taking a long time, or you can see that uh, the actual query is taking a long time. Maybe the time is being spent in your data source. The query is being as fast as it can, but the time is being spent on data source. So then that's, those kind of insights are the ones you can get from that. Um, the resource is kind of associated with the data source kind. It just like is the specification of Maybe you have a query that goes against like a three different SQL servers. The resource will let you like know which SQL server was hit at this time. The data source query basically represents what's the what query are we sending to this data source? And this will have like broadly two big forms. One could be a web form, which is the, in this example is a request and response. It's like an HTTP request and response and it will try to like approximate what like a request looks like uh, in the case of databases and other uh, other sources that like have a sql or mdx or some other like query language you will see uh, a sql uh, statement for example and i'm going to show you an example of that later um, the additional info column basically shows some uh, information that uh, didn't fit in any other column, so we just put it there. It's in some cases it's useful information, in some cases it's not as useful information. Uh, it's particularly useful in the case when you're using custom connectors because information that like uh, was logged from custom connectors will show up in this column. So always make sure to like see what kind of columns are available when you do. A, you might want to expand them also. It's a record. The row count uh, is supported for. Uh, database the kind of data sources so we're going to see how many rows we retrieved for web data sources it's uh, we will fill the column called content length which means how many bytes we retrieved this will let you like see uh, sometimes like you might have like some metadata calls that are taking more data than the actual data so you can like pinpoint some kind of issue there uh, just a few more columns left. We have a easiest query basically tells you if the query is something that you wrote or if it's a query that Power BI wrote to resolve something else. Uh, the path is a little bit of a more advanced concept. It uh, tries to represent all these actions that we're seeing here as a tree. And then each node in the path is like a, the last element in the path. We represent what uh, the current line is and then we will see for example here we have a uh, for line four we see that it like finishes in three so the id for this query is three uh, and the parent of three is two so in the so the line above so in the line three that will be action number two so that will be the parent and then it has a couple of child we have like a number four and number five those will be childs of the one above uh, so that lets us like see how the query was behaving in terms of timing. This is basically, it's completely based on timing. Um, and finally, group ID, um, it represents like if, if we're looking at the aggregated view, it represents what group uh, the aggregation took place. So if you like uh, if you look at the detailed and the aggregated view, you can like uh, find a relationship between these two views by looking at the group ID. Thanks, Jorge. Yeah, no uh, so if we look here, um, what we're going to see in this is that it emitted a request for um, top 1,000 on customers. 
Uh, so that's, you know, that's interesting. I didn't really do any interesting transformations, but this, this tells us what type of query was emitted. Um, now, let's say I want to uh, apply some transformations to this. Well, we can think of a couple transformations that we might apply. Uh, first, we might apply a filter. Um, actually, let's filter this to sales representative. And uh, then let's say we want to uh, group by the country. OK. So basically, this tells us that maybe we were just trying to get a, how, an idea of how many sales representatives from each country. So we have four in Germany, three in the UK, one in the rest of the countries. OK, cool. But how does this actually uh, get sent to OData? So I'm pressing our um, Diagnose Step button again. And in a moment, it will append a table. Let's see. I am on a dev build here, so if I have to end up reloading the editor, that's due to the fact that I'm on a dev build. Do you think I should reopen it, Jorge? Uh, I'm not sure what's happening. Uh, what's, what's the status? Oh, there we go. go back just, to took a, just took a second to... Uh, now you can see why it took a second, because you have a query diagnostics. Yeah. OK, so we can see what the uh, actual query emitted was. And this is kind of the basics of understand of using this to parse um, what's going on. So we can see that the, the final request emitted, it hit the customer's table, which you can see here. And it did filter the contact title, so it was sales representative. But the grouping that we did didn't get sent to OData, because the OData doesn't have that concept. Um, so the grouping had to have happened locally. So this is kind of the very basics of what you would end up doing to understand um, what kind of queries are emitted and uh, what's folding and whatnot. Uh, we can also um, do this with SQL. Now, with SQL, I've actually already done a, uh, already built this exact same um, table. So this is also Northwind data, except it's in a SQL endpoint rather than in an OData endpoint, which I, I like to do to compare. Uh, and I, I put out a, a detailed table. So we can see that the detailed table has a lot, a lot more rows. Um, and that's because it's getting a lot of stuff like connection creation and disposal. Um, it's talking everything with uh, generating preview, um, opening and closing data readers. There's just a lot of like very small actions happening under the hood that aren't user. There's nothing you as a user can really do to be to act on them. So in the aggregated view, we hide them, but we show them in the detailed view. So uh, one important thing just to mention is that uh, while the aggregated view has less rows, there is no information loss compared to the detailed view. Like the actions will only be like a. The, what happens is that a set of rows within a detailed view get compressed into a single row. But if that compression would lead to any data loss, like if, if you would lose like a data source query because of that, then we won't do that compression. We would avoid doing that compression. So there's really like no loss in the, There's only like a aggregation happening, but not at the expense of losing information. So I've pre-built this out. This is the... Um the tree diagram uh, visual that was recently added to Power BI in the last few months. Uh, but what you can see in this view is that um, in the first ID, which is the only one, 1.1, we have a bunch of different categories. 
Um, now, one of these categories uh, is um, data source, which I'll click on here. And so you could give it a second to think. Um, but you can see in each category how much time is taken up by different operations that comprise that category as a percentage of the whole. So uh, everything in the um, in the category column here will add up to the 1.0 in the ID column, and then everything in the a category specific uh, sub pieces will add up here. So 0.62 plus 0.13 plus all of these that are less than even 1% are going to add up to this 0.75. And we can see in execute query that there's a sequence of queries that were emitted, and we can see kind of how long each one took. So actually, the one that took the longest was getting the metadata. Uh, it wasn't actually getting the final data, it was getting the metadata. Now that's because this is a really fast query. Um, I kind of use it for demo purposes because it's not useful to have a five minute long query running on a demo. Uh, but if you had a longer um, query, something more normal for your reporting, it would still show this as a matter of, you know, probably milliseconds and your longer queries would be taking seconds or minutes. Um, so if we go in here, we can actually see that the query that we're looking for, so to speak, the query that retrieves the data that we think about getting sent is this one here. Um, now this was done in the preview, which is why you see the select top 1000. Um, and you see some, some formatting that how Power Query wraps the queries, but it should be pretty obvious what it's doing. Um, it's grabbing the columns that we cared about from that uh, table. Um, and it's looking for where the contact title is sales representative and it's grouping by country. So we can see that here, unlike in the O data, that entire um, sequence of operations is getting mapped to the SQL server. So it's happening remotely instead of locally. Um, I happen to like to use this particular way to look at data, but there's all sorts of ways to do it. You could use, um, uh, you could make each evaluation or each action or each category its own um, column in a column chart. I've done that before. Uh, you could do a group column chart to look at it. There's a lot of ways you can look and see how the data is broken up. And obviously, there's a good old table uh, if you just want to see what your data source queries are. Um, so just for one last kind of one last go, if you want to see... One, one other I wanted to make uh, was that like... Uh... In general, you shouldn't be too much too concerned about performance of metadata queries. I mean, unless it's really bad, because they usually get cached, so they will only be like uh, executed one time, and then yeah. they will be cached, and the next time it will be retrieved from the cache. So that's like a, not something you should look for. I mean, it's interesting to see, but I mean, it's not like a not necessarily a, an action that you need to take. Let's see. So for this is just another quick way that you might want to look at look at it, um, and then you could plug in a table and you could you know click on you could uh, you could click on this and see exactly what everything was. So category and um, operation. Okay, and we can see the one that takes the most time here is the execute query action. So this is just some ways that um, I personally find it useful to look at this data. Now I'm going to actually hand it back over to Jorge. Um, he's going to be going over how query diagnostics goes into some more technical things that are beyond just queries and look at um, or beyond just kind of the the top level evaluation operations and um, look at how performance counters and um, privacy partitions and, and kind of how you look at those. Uh, and I think if we're lucky, we might even get a little bit of how he uses it to look at SAP. Yeah, we will. So um, I will stop sharing and you can start. Sure. So I'm going to start with a demo for the data privacy partitions. Uh, 
So first I want to just go back here just to like uh, do a quick recap on the options available in the, this options dialog. Because some of them might be important. So in the options dialog, if we go to diagnostics or we click this diagnostic options button, we're going to hit this query diagnostic section. Uh, the first option here determines uh, what kind of uh, listener we use to capture the traces. So some users reported they couldn't uh, you capture diagnostics because they were running, they were not running as admin, they were using the store version of Power BI. So if you run into that issue, you will get like a, a pop-up that says, oh, you want to switch to the, the version that only works in the query editor. And you can do that and then you will, you will automatically switch to this mode, which is enabling query editor. What this means is that when you're in this mode, we capture all evaluations that go to a mashup engine, whether they are executed here within the Power Query Editor or whether you're refreshing a visual outside the Query Editor. When you use this other mode, uh, it's a local mode that will only capture the evaluations within the Power Query Editor. Uh, we're working on like enabling the functionality so that it, this one can also, also capture, the one that doesn't require admin can also capture evaluations outside, but that's like a future improvement to the product. Uh, then we have diagnostic level, which uh, Colin already went through. Uh, so here I'm gonna, I have aggregated, aggregated selected. Um, and finally we have like two more uh, outputs, we call them, uh, performance counters and data privacy partitions. I'm gonna start with data privacy partitions. So I'm gonna just select these and say, okay. Uh, these uh, options are like, a just one more note these options are like uh, additive so you can have you can select which whichever you want and you will only get the output for that like if you don't want to have like a million queries emitted when you do the diagnostic session just select here what you're interested in you can choose it at any time and it will update and um, so here i have a query it's called merge uh, and this, if we look at the source for this query, it's basically doing a merge of part of my one another query called part and C. So I have two queries, one called part. It's basically a file query. And I have C, which is a SQL query. Let me look at what they do. This one is SQL database. Um, so it's a pretty simple query, but it has uh, some uh, different privacy levels. So when you have different privacy levels, in order to avoid like a leak of information when you're like merging sources, we have something called a data privacy partitions. So we will partition the data so that these leaks can't happen. So if I do diagnostics on these, uh, this is a new feature we're introducing in the May release of uh, uh, Power BI. No, on the April release of Power BI. No, is it April? No, yeah. Uh, no, May, sorry, May release. The counters come in April and the diagnostics, the firewall partitions come in May. Yeah, and April has, I believe, been pushed out until the start of May. So I think there may be two versions coming in May. I'm not sure. Don't take my word for it yet. So. But I'm, well, that's basically the idea. Uh, so then I'm going to go here and say diagnosis. Can you explain the columns? Yeah, uh, let me just, like, let's finish. So since I said I got aggregated and partitions, I'm gonna get both. I'm gonna go first to partitions. And we're gonna have first the ID column. Like in case I was doing a, one of these diagnostic sessions, then I would get uh, more IDs here. In that case, it would be important to filter for a specific ID because otherwise these data doesn't make much sense. Um, so this is how the engine is resolved in this query. It's like a partition in this query in five different partitions because of how I have these like horrible mix of query. Then uh, for, the, for these partitions, it assigned different uh, privacy levels. The privacy levels, like if I go to the options dialog, I can set the privacy levels for my data sources. Uh, and that is, I think here, I can set the privacy levels for each one of my data sources. If I set them all to the same privacy levels, then I, basically allow the leaking of information 
and then I wouldn't have when I run this query, I wouldn't have the firewall partitions. We can do an example of that. Um, so this firewall group will tell me how are they grouped. This is untrusted, this is untrusted, this is trusted. Okay, so there's they are partitioned. This one will tell me what resources were accessed by each or one of these partitions. Each partition is basically like a sub-evaluation. So instead of having one evaluation that resolves everything, this query was split in five different evaluations. And so in this partition, for example, is only going to this uh, folder. This partition is going to SQL. And this partition is also going to SQL. Uh, these uh, partition inputs allow me to see how these partitions are connected. So from here, I can tell that partition partition merge one uh, got uh, data from partition part source and partition C. So these two are feeding merge one. And then I can see that part source was a, a product of removed other columns and categories. Um, we have this expression column. Uh, this is telling me what the expression was evaluated for each one of these partitions. Uh, the expression might be useful in cases when I want to like, when uh, uh, the additional operation was applied on top of my query. So for example, since I'm running these in the preview mode, it's gonna add a table first n. Even if I didn't have a table first n, it's gonna add it because we don't want the preview to be very big. Um, then it's gonna just show me timing for the partition. It's gonna tell me, okay, start at this time, finish at this time. This was the total duration. And this one, this was the exclusive duration. So it follows the same principle of calculating an exclusive duration as the detailed and aggregated views. Um, and then it shows me a percentage of the exclusive duration. So from just from looking at this, I can see that my trouble partition, if I have a trouble partition, would be this one, right? So maybe then I don't even care about the other partitions because this one is taking 95% of the time. If I'm having a performance issue, I know this is gonna be here. Um, finally, if when I capture these uh, data privacy partitions, I also capture like diagnostics, then it's gonna like show me a link here, like filtering the diagnostics to just show me the, those specific to this partition. So when we added this uh, feature to, to uh, query diagnostics, we also added a new column in the output, it's called a partition key column. And again, this is like brand new, uh, it just came out. Um, it's just coming out, so it's like not even documented. So you see the first time we talk about this. Uh, so this new partition key is gonna tell me which, each one of these lines, where is it coming from? Which partition is coming from? So this can be useful to like narrow down like some, uh, details about the partition, about what happened, right? So here we can see that they have a mix of like a Montego Ref 6 Northwind, which is a SQL Server database, uh, uh, and some other data sources. Um, so that's basically what I wanna show for partitions. Now let's just for, just for the sake of uh, entertainment, let's just, run the same query, run the same diagnostics, but I'm gonna turn off the firewall, turn off the data privacy partitions. If I say here, ignore privacy levels and potentially improving performance, then there's not gonna be a private, uh, different partition, it's gonna should be like a single partition. I can improve performance, it's gonna be a single one, but at, at the risk of like leaking information. If like, uh, if I'm joining two data sources, one data from one data source could go into the other data source. So it's like a risky thing to do. If I go back here and I say another one, another time diagnose step. So now if I go to partitions, yeah. what happened? Oh, I didn't get even, I didn't even get partitions. This was at 3.15. So I didn't get partitions because there are no partitions. It's just a single evaluation. So, yeah. 
Um, so that's a demo for the partitions. Uh, the other one I want to show is the SAPVW. So for that, I'm going to connect to an SAPVW server. I can do it from, I'm not going to do it because we're like uh, running out of time. So I'm just going to connect here just to show. Can you uh, show the perf counters here? I have a, I'm going to show it in, uh, sure. Uh, well, then let, let me switch to my other, I have another one here prepared for the performance counters. So here's a query I just wanted to do it from scratch. Just, just to show it. Let's do it from scratch. Okay, so here is the business warehouse. So here I go to my server. I'm going to go to like select one of these cubes, for example, favorite one, which is Europe. US sales. Just a couple of things here. And something interesting about the uh, about the SAP sources is that they have like very really good diagnostics, if I may say so myself. And in here I'm gonna select the aggregated, the detailed. And the, I'm going to select everything except the data privacy partitions. I don't want partitions right now. Um, so I'm going to go OK. And then I'm going to evaluate this query. Uh, one shortcut for these, you can also click right click on a query here and say diagnose. And it has exactly the same effect as clicking on the diagnose step button. Uh, so we got the results back. So we have here the counters. So the counters is basically a timestamp followed by the different counters that were retrieved. We're like uh, pulling the counters every half a second. Yeah, so we get information on processor time, total processor time, IO data bytes per second, commit, and working set. Um, so these counters are very useful if you have like a situation where like uh, your query is consuming uh, too much memory and you want to see what uh, in what time frame was that memory like uh, spiked or what might have caused these to spike so based on this timestamp you could like uh, correlate it with the data that you have here and maybe say oh okay might spike because i was doing this connection or i was like uh, opening a connection to the data source so that kind of information um in a short query like this is not very interesting information uh, so i prepared another example which is this one which is a little bit longer uh, so it tells me for example at one point my query was taking 31 percent of the possible time uh, and that it coincided with uh, it was retrieving the most amount of data at this time too uh, if I see what was happening, like I can see that this query was retrieving uh, 4,000 rows. I can see here that my query was retrieving 4,000 rows and it was doing this while executing this MDX statement against SAPVW. So it's a particularly nasty statement because it has like a lot of cross joints, that's why it's so slow. Um, and uh, another interesting, this is like uh, the aggregated view. Uh, another interesting thing, for example, for the for SAPVW in particular, is that we can like uh, to resolve a query. SAPVW requires uh, calls to multiple different puppies. So here it will like uh, detail you which puppies were called and how long it took to call each one of these puppies. So this is like a pure server time. So we can see that, for example, this query took 34 seconds just in the to retrieve the data from the data source. So if we see that the duration, this started like at, this query started at 
10, 10, 21, and it finished. So it took about like a, what, like 40 seconds. And 35, 34 of those seconds were spent just retrieving data. So it seems like, a, like if we want to fix something about this query, probably we need to start looking at the data source and not really at the query, because the query is not gonna, I mean, or we can like rem remove some things from the query to make it faster. Um, I prepared a, visual, a small visualization of these counters just to see what they look like uh, in a graph mode. Uh, so if we look at these counters here, we can see that like the behavior is, uh, here we have a spike. This is a IO database per second. We can see that mostly all these spikes are coinciding. So we don't have it in like strange scenarios. We have like at the beginning of the query, it was like a starting the querying and it spiked here and then it went down. Uh, it usually works to see like a COVID-19 graphs where everything is going up, up, up. That's something you don't want to see. If it goes up and down, that's kind of normal. Uh, here for processor time, we have like two spikes. Uh, this is total processor time. So it like a, had a big jump here, but then it stabilized. It wasn't taking like uh, too much. And this is memory consumption. So it also had like a bump here and then it stabilized. So overall we see that like we have a hit in the beginning, but then it goes basically to nothing. So it means not a very concerning uh, situation here. Um, so that's basically it for a, uh, for privacy partitions, a little bit of SAP and uh, counters. Thanks, Jorge. Yeah, no problem. Uh, uh, so, you have anything else you wanted to show? No, I think that's it. Uh, and just a reminder that these features are coming. Uh, another more upcoming features. I mean, we can probably go back to the slides and we can discuss a little bit about the future. Yep. Can you? Uh... Oh, let me stop presenting. Yeah, great. So let me present. So let's talk a little bit about the future. Um, we have a number of things coming uh, that we're not going to put dates on, but we can talk a little bit about our goals. Um, the first of them is we want to make sure that there's better easy insights and a really clear um, example of this is we'd like to be able to tell you what steps have successfully folded. Um, so that's something that people have been asking for forever and we, we are aware of it and hoping that we can bring it soon. Uh, we'd like to improve the user interface. Uh, so today uh, you have to build out your um, table and then separately, you need to go back and visualize it with Power BI visualizations, which is fine, but it doesn't necessarily um, draw the eye to things that we know will be there. This isn't you know, generic data out of a database. We know what the columns are gonna be. Uh, so we're thinking a little bit about making it easier to make determinations based on that data. And then finally, uh, how we can surface more information. So now that we've laid the groundwork for query diagnostics, uh, Jorge is building on top of it and we're seeing just what kind of capabilities we can get to. Uh, we're a long way away from a full profiler, uh, but we are inspired by profilers as seen in various databases. Um, so kind of going back over what we talked about uh, and what the feature is, at this point we have a, a basis of query diagnostics that gives a lot more insight into what operations are happening, um, what kind of performance you're seeing, what kind of privacy partitions you have than what was ever available before. And you can take this data and parse it however you like in tables or visually uh, to try to understand what's going on with your query. And we have a lot of stuff that we're going to be incrementally adding. So uh, this isn't this isn't the end. Um, and I hope that you guys find it useful uh, and convenient. Um, so that's- so We have a uh, few questions in the, in yep, the Q &A. we have a few questions. Um, uh, yeah, I, so before we move on to the Q&A, let me just go through a couple of slides. So meanwhile, people can post questions in the chat. 
Bye. Let me stop sharing. Yeah, sure. I can share the screen. There we go. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Colin and John. That was a wonderful webinar, and I hope the audience loved it. Uh, so before we take up the Q&A, let me just go through a couple of slides more. And I request all the attendees, you can post your questions in the Q&A panel. So beyond this webinar, if you have any more questions, you can reach out uh, to any of our social channels and post your queries there. We will uh, take it up to the speakers and or either the community, someone from the community will definitely answer them. So as I talked about SQL Maestros, uh, you can visit uh, the website and learn more about their offerings like video courses. We have uh, all the, there are three video courses which have been uh, released. Video courses on performance tuning, SQL, uh, T-SQL querying and T-SQL programming. All the video courses are live. You can, uh, the video courses can be watched at the convenience of your home or work. So these are high quality HD professionally recorded videos, which you can watch anytime, anywhere and as many times as you want. So we have full length video courses as well as individual modules available. You can uh, check it in our website, sqlmaestros.com or uh, drop in an email to contact at sqlmaestros.com. So uh, SQL Maestros, the other offering from SQL Maestros is the hands-on labs. SQL Maestros has relaunched its hands-on lab subscription model. So uh, we believe that practice makes an individual perfect. So hands-on labs is a document-based learning where you'll be provided with the step-by-step -step instructions, observations, screenshots, and scripts. So by the end of each lab, you'll be an expert in that particular lab. So the good thing about hands-on labs is the reason, uh, and the reason community loves it, is its subscription model. So right now, once you purchase them, you can keep them for life. So go ahead and visit sqlmaestros.com. There are a couple of free hands-on labs available. So right now we have more than 100 labs on technologies related to SQL Server, Azure, Power BI, Analytics, Cosmos DB, etc. So uh, well with this, and we have next another webinar coming up this Thursday on uh, part two of how to troubleshoot a slow running query in SQL Server by Amit Bansal. And then we have coming up with the first uh, virtual symposium on SQL Server 2019. The link is given in the chat window. You can go ahead and book your seats. So the sessions and the speakers are all, uh, and the content is all finalized. You'll find all the details in the link available. So uh, before we wind up, uh, please help us in support and spread the word about the free events to help out the community. All you have to do is just copy paste this in, in either of your uh, social media channels. So that will definitely help people. Thank you all for your time and thank you Colin and George for the wonderful webinar. I know it's quite early for you and thank you so much. So let's uh, proceed towards the Q&A. I see we have two um, remaining open questions. Uh, so I can answer about the one about resources. Uh, yeah. So the question is how much resources taken by a diagnostics and impact on resource construction and performance. Uh, we try to minimize the the resources we use to actually capture the diagnostics to that effect when you select the, the first option that shows diagnostics in query editor and outside the query editor we use an ETW event tracing for Windows listener and those are known to be the most efficient kind of uh, perform like trace collectors in uh, available in Windows so we try to use that whenever possible if you can we use the another a different kind of listener the other listener is also like a uh, focus on performance so we really don't want to in general i haven't seen like a big hit of gathering uh, performance uh, if you uh, the data privacy partitions uh, is basically free information in terms of performance if you're already capturing the aggregated or, or detailed diagnostics and for the counters, uh, we do poll every half a second, just so you can get a good picture of what the query is behaving, especially for like queries that don't take a long time. But in general, we try also like to keep it performant. There's only like a one single thread polling for all the uh, counters. So I think that answers the question. And then to answer the other question, um, there's an ID column in the perf that will associate it with 
an evaluation. So as long as you construct your visual right, you'll be able to use it to understand what's causing your um, processor or I.O. graph to go up. Uh, one important thing about the I.O. Uh, those counters is that they are, those are counters exclusively for the evaluation that you're running and just for the all the processes involved but only for the evaluation it was like they're like very specific on what they show okay uh if that's it that's all the questions uh, well, like so, is there are no more questions and to all the attendees, we have posted a thank you note for the speakers in our uh, LinkedIn and Facebook uh, pages. The link is given in the chat window. I'd request you all to uh, leave us a feedback or comment. This will definitely encourage the speakers as well as organizers to come uh, and deliver even more webinars. So thank you, Colin and Gott. Thank you for your wonderful time. Thank yep. You. Have, a, have a nice afternoon. I think it's time for me to get to bed. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much.